really happens out in a deadly force confrontation. The target is threatening, the target is moving, probably advancing on you, uh, maybe running, maybe doing all sorts of stuff. Welcome to Black and Blue, the podcast that's just for you. We bring solutions to everyday problems. We are here to humanize the badge. By interviewing first responders and discussing their trainings, experiences, and publications. Black and Blue airs weekly at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in. So he had been criminally charged, and the defense attorney um, said, hey, he was looking around for uh, an expert within the state of Idaho. He had a couple of experts from Four Science um, that they were going to bring in. And, but he wanted a, a local flavor, if you will. <clears throat> and so he was asking around, and people kept pointing their fingers at me. And so he contacted me, and he came down and talked to me, and he said, hey, "You know, here's the facts and circumstances of the case." And and he says, and "Here's the video," because the video had not been released to the public. I watched the video, and I turned to him, and I said, "I'm in. What do you need?" Good case. The officer was looking for a suspect. They believed he had a gun. He had warrants for his arrest. He was running through the neighborhood. And uh, he, he was described as a white male with a uh, black shirt and tan pants. Uh, he broke into the, the home of the, the victim, if you will. Um, and the victim eventually chased him out of the house with a handgun. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the homeowner comes out of the house and he yells, hey, I got him over here. Well, the officer had to cross it, it's, you know, the yard to get to the gate to see what was going on. And when he gets there, he sees a white male and a black shirt with a handgun. And, you know, they, they order him to drop the gun. He turns towards them with the gun in, hand, in a low ready position and, and the officer shot him and, and killed him. And unfortunately, it was the homeowner. I mean, it was a very tragic, tragic set of circumstances. Uh, that kind of got me going and uh, and I helped out on the case. And ultimately, the, the, the judge dismissed the case with prejudice and um, the obvious civil suit that came along afterwards was settled. In patrol, you've got canine. You might have bike patrol. You might have, like where I came from, crime scene processing. You have accident investigation or crash investigation, depending on how it's called in your area. Um, and so you've got all these different disciplines. Um, then you've got SWAT. Within SWAT, there's all these you know, sub-disciplines between sniper and you know, your less lethal weapons and, and dealing with other types of weapons that are not typically available to a patrol officer. You go to investigations. Good grief. I mean, you want to talk about some complexities there. Computer crimes you know, um, child sex abuse and, and crimes, uh, those two usually go hand in hand with one another. And then you got sexual assault, you got all your your uh, theft, fraud, forgery, and then you get into robbery. Yeah. And each one of those brings their own specializations with them. And no agency really can afford to send people to training. And so it's really um, on us to develop a growth mindset mm-hmm and understand that one, your department can't pay for everything. And so maybe you got to dip into your own pocket and pay for some training. Right. Um, you know, I paid for a couple of trips out of Alaska to go to training that I felt was important for my development. Doing things like uh, just constantly learning. You don't always have to step into a classroom. You can pick up books. Yeah. Uh, here is um, doing safety differently. It's part of a class that I'm in right now through the Association of Force Investigators on uh, force analysis units. There's a lot of ways to to grow and develop that don't require you sitting in a classroom hoping that the department's going to pay for it. Um, but that's on you. Here on Black and Blue, we 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 do training experiences and publications uh, at least once a month. So therefore, all the trainings and experiences. Uh, that uh, were invested into that individual author slash law enforcement officer are invested in that book. And you can take and pick, get the, uh, what is it, chew up the meat and spit out the bones of each of those books. And that's training, lessons, education right there, like you just said. So when I work with new firearms instructors, there's a couple of questions I ask them. And the first question that I'll ask them, you know, if any of the guys from Idaho that <laughs> heard me ask them this, they're probably sick and tired of hearing it. But the first question I ask them is, is are you training to reality within the confines of safety? Mm. If you're not, then why are you doing it? Then the second, the next series of questions is, if you know with 100% certainty it's gonna be in a shooting tonight, would you train them different? Wow. And if the answer is yes, then how are you gonna do that? 
think I know that and again, there are exceptions to this. There are agencies that are doing really good jobs with firearms. And so don't send me hate mail, okay? I've talked to cops from across the United States and I hear a lot of the same thing. In fact, I just had a conversation uh, with an officer the other day from an agency and um, it's a, lar you know, a larger agency. Uh, and really their firearms instruction is get to the range, get your call done, get back on the street. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if if qualifications are your driving um, driving factor for your firearms training, you're really setting the officer up for failure. Because you know if we honestly look at what happens in a typical firearms qualification, you're on a square range, your target is at a set distance, it is non-threatening, it is non-moving, you're told how many shots to fire and in what time to fire it. How much thought process is involved in that? Listen for the beep, draw, shoot your prescribed number of shots, go back to your holster, listen for the beep. Or something to that effect, right? Mm -hmm. So what really happens out in a deadly force confrontation? The target is threatening, the target is moving, probably advancing on you, uh, maybe running, maybe doing all sorts of stuff. Um, you're moving. And oftentimes officers aren't accounting for their own movement. Um, you're trying to engage and all of these different things are playing that are coming into uh, this. Um, perceptual distortions, cognitive um, problems. I mean, it just, the list goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And so how are we reconciling those two issues? Well, the way that you do it in a training environment is, is you got to try to duplicate those conditions where and when you can. Right. Um, with the full knowledge that um, you cannot completely set up the same type of conditions um, that an officer is going to experience in the real world. Right. Um, we, let's say, for example, scenario training. So we put them through some realistic force on force training um, where the, the subject involved is moving, is, is probably shooting back with you know, non-lethal training ammunition and those kinds of things or you know, other types of props. Um, there's a fear of failing in front of your peers. There's a fear that you're going to get, you know, shot by one of these uh, non-lethal training rounds um, and it's going to hit you someplace soft and anybody has been in that training, we all know, right? But does it really duplicate the stress level and the anxiety and the fear and some of the other perceptual distortion problems that come with being in a real gunfight? No, a little bit illegal and slightly unethical for me to actually shoot at you with real bullets, you know, to give you that effect. <laughs> so how do we, how do we recognize? reconcile those two things and and that's when you run smack dab into reality.